okay so we talked about uh, blurring and noise all of these are uh, aspects that are affecting our image quality right so now we need to proceed little bit further in understanding how to characterize this noise saying that noise is something undesirable right it is fluctuation around the ground truth so you are estimating some uh, signal and the fluctuation around that is uh, is the noise so beyond merely saying that noise is detrimental and it affects the image quality as uh, viewed in this example here we should go one step ahead and see if we can characterize the noise capture the noise understand using that captured model is there a way that we can minimize the noise eventually right so that is the the goal here so it is going to be a very brief uh, overview when we get into the the individual modality right later on that time we'll again recall some of the basic uh, overview that we did now and contextualize within the context of the respective modality so here it's going to be a little broad brush uh, i would uh, kind of kind of warn you right you shouldn't look at so this one what we are going to cover in the next few slides if you if you find it uh, very unfamiliar the suggestion is please go get yourself familiarized with okay because these are something that are considered very basic that you should you you almost likely would have encountered by now so what we have done so far is when we talked about imaging system we said g of x comma y is your output f of x comma y is your input right so underlying 3d ground truth distribution is your f of x y the objective of medical imaging system which is characterized by h of x comma y is to capture the ground truth right from inside the body and present it as a output image g of x comma y so if you recall the block diagram g of x comma y should be as close as possible to f of x comma y this f of x comma y is the 3d distribution of uh, whatever parameter right that the imaging system is going to exploit to see inside the body so this is fine we have covered so much using just this model but in reality the moment you are going to use a system to measure right then there is going to be noise and so more correctly this model should be updated with a term here that characterizes that that stands for noise noise at x comma y since your image is going to be spatial right each location there is going to be an estimate of the ground truth right whatever is f of x comma y is the ground truth g of x comma y that location is estimating what is supposed to be there at f of x comma y using the system h of x comma y so there is a noise at each location each measurement that you are doing so now we need to talk about little bit more about how do we understand characterize what are the common source of noise how do we describe them right so good news is okay this model seems complete that is i have in reality i know there is going to be some noise so we have put a, a, a term here to account for it but if you really look at it we say it's a fluctuation around right you you are you have an estimate the ground truth that you want to measure when you measure that you are always going to have a uh, a uh, 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 fluctuation around the ground truth that fluctuation is what is called as noise right so in some sense uh, it is going to be random right it is not going to be deter random means it is it cannot be determined uh, you cannot say oh this is going to be the value 100% so it is going to be random so that means you need to brush up so the idea is okay if it is random that means uh, oh we cannot do anything about it so uh, we will have to live with it is that one approach or if it is random maybe we can understand certain thing certain parameters about this randomness so we can capture this randomness and then use it to our advantage right so the beauty of uh, random is although you cannot say with 100% certainty what the value is going to be there are well different defined theories about randomness quantifying this randomness measuring some quantities to describe the randomness 
and uh, therefore uh, you can all these based on probabilities and therefore you can still make use of uh, uh, the knowledge to see how you can reduce the noise okay so n of x comma y is the noise it is a random variable so all of the random variable uh, stochastics random processes those courses that you would have taken you should probably uh, brush it okay random variable at each x comma y so that means you will recall probability distribution function probability density function right so you have probability distribution function capital pdf is nothing but the probability of that n less than equal to the eta right it is below a certain value so now n of x comma y could be continuous or discrete right so then you will have to recall okay there is continuous random variable maybe discrete random variable uh, so you should start to recall some of the probability density functions right what is the relationship between a distribution function and density function so please go review those here we'll quickly just say okay you have a relationship so you can get probability density function from probability uh distribution function say so they both are related and uh, the moment we say probability distribution function of a random variable you should recall some of the commonly used probability distribution function you should know how to write mathematically common pdfs so what are the common pdfs that come to your mind by this time or oh, there could be uniform distribution there could be gaussian right that is something that you would have encountered which you will encounter even here gaussian right the normal distribution so these are very essential you need to go brush that up look at the you know uh, formulation how it is described so that i leave it to you but uh, why is this advantages to have a pdf so i said it is random but then you can capture the randomness right using certain attributes right you have a probability distribution function you can describe the distribution function using some statistics right some attributes of that function for example most commonly the expected values right so the mean and variance right so there could be several expected values right that could be uh, associated with the distribution function but something like a, a gaussian for example is unique if i know just the mean and variance i know the complete distribution function i know the complete randomness right so so there are several desirable uh, characteristics that make gaussian uh, very relevant and very appropriate for several of the Uh, noise models uh, of course you will also encounter uniform random variable right so you need to brush up those two at the least the other one that we will encounter is discrete random variables even discrete one of the common ones that we will end up using is poisson random variable discrete poisson random variable what is a poisson so here again when it is discrete probability distribution function we saw for continuous probability mass function so please go look up about discrete random variables when you have discrete random variables one of the interesting pdf is your poisson poisson random variable what is its distribution the probability that the n takes a value k discrete value k is given by this distribution right here a power k by k factorial exponential of minus a, a is just a non zero or greater than zero real value but what is interesting about this random variable right poisson's random variable is this guy mu is mean right sigma n square is your variance look at this so your mean and variance are the same quantity a so that means this is a distribution that can be described if i can capture the mean and variance and it turns out that 
mean and variance happens to be the same value which is the a here right so why is this important uh, uh, in the in our context because gaussian i think you would have heard several times in different courses as well poisson not so much why is this uh, highlighted here because one of the modalities that we are going to do right x ray imaging or ga ga nuclear medicine gamma all of these are photons so there is enough statistical analysis that has been done to say that the photon energy that is coming and hitting the detector right the number of photons that are coming and hitting that can be modeled right there is a fluctuation there and that turns out to fit a poisson random variable and therefore this since we are going to cover x ray based modality and uh, nuclear medicine based modality so in the imaging system context because of the the nature of uh the physics right the photons that are coming in the number of photons that are coming and hitting the detector area that has been found to be modeled the fluctuations there has been found to be modeled with poisson's random variables this will come in very handy okay of course um, when you do that you will also encounter uh, when when you do that as in review the materials you will encounter independent random variables right so you can have different random variables not just one you could have multiple random variables n1 to nm each one could have their own distribution what is of interest is sum of all so you could have noise coming from different subsystems for example different source we are not really bothered about that we are interested in saying oh the end image quality is affected our objective is to reduce that noise understand that noise characterize that noise and try to reduce that noise so if you have multiple sources that are contributing multiple random variables then we are still effectively looking at a combined effect okay of course while we are here when you have multiple random variables right independent random variables what will be the sum of so you have a random variable which is sum of different random variables what will be the distribution for s okay go review why gaussian is very powerful okay that is the clue i'm giving so if you have sum of multiple random variables independent random variables then the distribution function of that random variable right the sum of random variables tends to something okay so please go look that up so these are aspects which you probably know i just want you to take that extra effort go back to your textbook from previous semesters on say stochastics random processes and uh, flip the page and uh, you will quickly recognize some theorem that i am talking about okay uh, so if you have this then you your your mean of the signal is sum of all and your sigma s square is sum of which is your variance is sum of all so this is very uh um advantages of independent random variables we can simply do this if you have sum of independent random variables mean just adds up your variance just adds up okay and then this is your convolution operator if you recall okay so this is something that you need to um brush up and then another thing that you would have encountered is when we talk about nice okay so we have this random variable we talk about uh, uh, capturing the mean and variance right then let's talk about some of the noise that you might have heard okay first thing is white noise i'm sure you would have heard this what does it mean it means that noise values at different positions two things it is independent of each other so i have x comma y right that is dif different locations so what is there at one location does not depend on what is there in the other location this is independent of the other location not only that even with that the noise that is at one position or in another position is independent of position so noise at a position is independent of that position and noise at two positions are also independent okay so if that is the case then we get what is called as white noise so how do we write about write it in terms of uh, whatever we have covered so far how how does the distribution function look right so 
uh, that means mean and variance so when we talk about uh, noise values are independent of each other that means mean and variance at different locations are same and it is it is not dependent on other location so if you have white noise which are independent then naturally there should be the other case where there could be some correlation so that is called as correlated noise which effectively says if it is not independent there is one location there is another location so noise at one location is some way related correlated to noise at another location so that is what we mean by correlated noise so the noise at adjacent, adjacent positions are correlated so if you say something is correlated then you should be able to quantify the amount of correlation right so what do you do right you will get into this correlation describe by correlation function the interesting aspect is correlation function is in spatial right different positions how they are correlated that is a, a spatial signal if you if you would like to call it that way or think about it that way if there is a spatial then you have a counterpart in frequency domain so you take the fourier transform of correlation right that gives you what is called as noise power sectoral density so if there is a correlated noise right if there is some correlation so essentially you are correlating different positions in so using correlation function that is in spatial domain if you take the fourier transform of that in frequency domain what you get is the power spectral density but we call it noise power spectral density right or simply noise power spectrum u comma v okay so now what are we interested we are interested in getting to what is white noise what is correlated noise okay have some functions we have introduced for correlation so how do i put them together so white noise has your power spectral density will be constant right so that means constant means in over the ex entire uv right everywhere it is the same value so irrespective of the frequency u comma v you have the same value of noise that is what is white noise okay um so now i mean always the point is noise is something that we understand characterize you know use all the uh, simplifications for example uh, take white noise for example right we say okay independent noise is independent and therefore we can use white noise simplification why because it's easier uh, uh, to say that all the frequency components are contributing equal the noise is coming from all the frequency components that's what that whiteness meant right and uh, almost always noise you don't talk it in isolate talk about it in isolation because our interest is not actually noise <laughs> right what is our interest our interest is signal the only problem is while we are trying to go after the signal while we are trying to estimate the signal you are not able to get to the exact value because of some random fluctuations so the noise comes i mean fortunately or unfortunately you are now not able to talk about signal in isolation the ground truth in isolation you are ending up talking about noise in the context of signal so therefore what is more appropriate what will be used most of the time when you talk about image quality is signal to noise ratio ideally you want only signal no noise right that is your ideal scenario but we already talked about there is going to be because you are doing an estimate there is inherently going to be some fluctuation which will contribute to the noise so you are going to have signal to noise that is more important to capture the quality we already saw the effect of noise right in that that sagittal image so it is degrading the uh, quality when we say degrading quality we we saw that the contrast was going down the resolution was going down in fact we talked if the resolution is poor the contrast probably goes down so noise did the same effect right you you put noise there the image quality was going down 
So, in some sense, if you are to talk about image quality, it is just not noise per se. We would like to talk about the quality in terms of signal to noise ratio. Then the question is how do you define what is signal, how do you define what is noise, right. So, here for example, one way, one metric that is used is, oh, because you are, see you have a quantity that you are going to measure. So, I, I measure at that location. Now, you are telling me if I make one measurement, right, at that location, that is not uh, ground truth because there is a system, there is a noise to it and therefore, the one measurement that you made is not the ground truth signal amplitude, right. So, then what do I do? So, one way to look at it is, okay, I can do signal to noise ratio based on amplitude of the function to amplitude of the noise. So, where do I get my noise? I get my noise because of fluctuation. So, that means at that location, I will do like, so the, the signal itself is also random, but I want the ground truth signal because that is my signal, noise is corrupting it. So, if you did random variables, if you did all the estimates, right, you, what quantity did you come across, which is the unbiased estimate that we can use for signal amplitude or oh, if I have multiple measurements, mean, right, mean is a unbiased estimate. So, that what that means is, if you do mean multiple, right, n tends number of observation goes large, you do this multiple times, then your mean estimate actually gets to the actual ground truth, right. So, you could use amplitude, then what is your noise, oh, noise is fluctuation. What is fluctuation in a random variable? Variance. Oh, but numerator is just amplitude. Here, variance is square. So, I could use standard deviation. What is standard deviation? Oh, it is fluctuation around the mean, which is what our definition of noise is. So, one way of capturing signal to noise ratio is using the mean to standard deviation of the estimate. Why is this important? Let us take an example, right. So, <coughs> we will we'll start with projection radiography, you know, when we start the modality, but for now, without going to the details, let us say if, I, I, here what we will encounter is we are shooting x rays, right, x ray photons through the body. So, number of photons that are counted, like I said when we talked about Poisson distribution, number of photons G counted per unit area follows a Poisson distribution. So, what you are given is the characteristic of the signal is given, okay. What I mean by characteristic is, oh, it is a, the number that is coming, you send number of photons, number of photons are coming through the body on the other side. It turns out that the number of photons counted per unit area follows a distribution, a Poisson distribution. So, in this case, what will be our signal amplitude? Oh, signal amplitude is number of photons that came through the body at that location, right. We are projecting, it is coming out, your detector is capturing. So, number of photons that came, whether it is attenuated more or less in the path, that is, that is the idea, right. So, you will get number of photons captured. So, the average number that is captured is your signal. So, what will be our noise amplitude? noise amplitude is going to be the fluctuation around the mean, which is your standard deviation. So, now, given this information, can you calculate the signal to noise ratio for this? So, you will write out, oh, I have mean mu, noise is the standard deviation. So, mu by sigma of what is the random variable here? Random variable is g. So, mu suffix g by sigma suffix g is your signal to noise ratio. Can you simplify this any further? Do you have any other clue? Do you, can you, can you simplify it any further? So, write down mu by sigma, right. 
is that the final form can you use any other information quickly that is why I said you should recognize do you know anything about the distribution I know this is a poison distribution if it is poison distribution what is the clue you have oh I know the mean mu is equal to variance both are same value right what is standard deviation or oh, standard deviation is nothing but square root of my variance so that means I can have my mean and standard deviation are related right in this in, in this specific Poisson distribution. So, signal to noise ratio amplitude is mu g by sigma g, but I know mu g is for example, mu and sigma g is square root of mu. Why? Because that is my Poisson distribution where your mean and uh, variance are same standard deviation is square root of variance. So, what do you get? You get signal to noise ratio amplitude is square root of mu. Fantastic. Without going further detail, you should already look at it and say, oh, if I want a, a good signal to noise ratio or at least if I want to increase the signal to noise ratio, all I need to do is increase my mu. What is mu? Is the number of photons per unit area. That means, increase the number of photons per unit area. What does that mean? What does it imply? Well, I mean, I need to send more x-ray photons through the body, right? So, then you see the problem. Mathematically, we will say, oh, beautiful, I know how to increase SNR. But the problem in medical imaging system and biomedical engineering in, in, in you know, at the, at the bigger level is, we will have to always take a patient you know human body centric approach safety is an important aspect in order to increase the signal to noise ratio if i start sending more x-ray through the body you will see that that is not a good idea okay because of the ionizing effects and so on and so forth which we will carefully define going forward okay but you you see the context the plain application of the concepts mathematics so far but we cannot just be blind, especially in the biomedical, we cannot just be blinded by our physics and math or our background from one of the core areas and say, oh, I can do it. I think there should be an appreciation for the interaction of all this with the context of human body. Okay, that is a point that we will we'll touch upon this very often. Okay, so a higher exposure can lead to higher SNR. So, we will talk about what do we mean by exposure, what do we mean by ionization, all that we will we will talk about. Okay, so now you are, so is there any other way to do it? Okay, this is based on amplitude, I am sure you would have heard. You can get signal to noise ratio in terms of the power, power in the signal to power in the noise, right, that also you can. So, it is, you have to look at the definition in the context, how people have defined, not just jump based on the numerical value, say this is better or the other. It is just that they could have defined signal to noise ratio in their context slightly differently. One another common way is power signal to noise ratio. So, when you do power signal to noise ratio, typically you report it in decibels. Okay? And uh, one of the most common mistakes that I find uh, in this course and few other courses where I have this uh, ratio of signal to noise ratio. right? Sometimes you give the amplitude, but then the students use the dB formulation for power or vice versa. Why? Because signal to noise ratio in dB is straightforward. Amplitude square is your right. So you can you can think about uh, ten log ten SNR power or 20 log SNR A. So, how do you this factor whether you are using 20 or 10 depends on whether the SNR is calculated as amplitude or as power. Okay. So, depending on that you will see this is the ratio which is 2, 10 or 100 whereas SNR will be in dBs, will be 3, 10, 10 and 20. Okay. So, if I have uh, 
SNR is 100, right? SNR P is 100, then log 10, 100 log 10, 100 is 10 square, right? So, 2 comes out, so that is your 20, so that is your 20 dB, clear? So, this is something that you need to get comfortable with. So much so for uh, signal to noise ratio, power and uh, amplitude signal to noise ratio. Let us move on a bit and talk about the other source of other factors that affect the image quality. Artifacts, distortion, accuracy. Artifacts, what are artifacts? Oh, that is also noise is what because it distracts the signal. Right, that's, but then it's not quite so. Artifacts are something. See, whatever we carefully define noise, we talked about noise in terms of the randomness. Right. So each time you make a measurement, you're not going to get the exact value because of fluctuation, which is due to noise. Whereas artifacts are nothing but you see something that is actually not there. You may some imaging systems can create image features that do not represent a valid object or false shape or textures. That means, in my f of x comma y, I do not have something, whereas in g of x comma y, I see a presence of a feature. Okay? If there is a presence of a feature or I see a, 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 a circular shape, when I know at that location, there should not be a circular shape, that should be a, a triangular shape for example, right, in that cross section view. So, that means you have something that you are seeing in the image, which is because of the imaging system, that gives you an impression of an object which is either not there or the other features that are not corresponding to the ground truth that is your artifact that means each time you do it you will see the same uh, effect right so it is reproducible in some sense okay so that is artifact we will will look at few example artifacts so that you can get a feel for it distortion distortion again is a challenging one distort means that there is a truth there is a change there is a a difference from the truth, right? Distorted from the truth. So, it is the same context. Distortion means some imaging system may distort the actual shape position. This is mostly geometric effect, okay? And other geometries of the imaged object. So, that is distortion. When you talk about accuracy, there are two types of accuracy. One is your conformity to truth, right? I am doing some measurements. How close is the measurement to the actual ground truth? That is one kind of so, which we call as conformity to the truth. The other accuracy is I am using this imaging modality and I am trying to use the image to do some diagnosis, right? The doctor is saying based on this you have, uh, you know, you, you, you have a tumor that is stage 2 or you have to go for a surgery. So, he is making uh, some assessment based on the image. So, the other accuracy has to do with clinical utility. How many times? the decisions based on this image, features from this image is how does it, how accurate is it to the ground truth clinical condition, okay. So, that is clinical utility. So, we will kind of quickly go through all of these in the next few, next 10, 15 minutes or so, okay. First is artifacts, like I said non-random, is you can reproduce this because I know how I can obtain that. So, artifact most commonly features that do not correspond to real object, this is the key and not due to noise because noise is random. If it is due to noise, then it, this will also become random. So, this is not random. I can in fact create artifact because I know where it is coming from, okay. So, when we talk about some of the common artifacts that you uh, encounter, some of which actually you might recognize the moment I put it, right? Say if you take, uh, 
if you take uh, the recording system that's happening right your camera video camera right say let's take us you are taking a picture let's not go into video let's take a picture when you do a picture right and your objective is to measure the width of my finger or width of my hand whatever right this is the objective you take an image you want to measure the width of my hand i have a ground truth measurement that is there but you are using the image to measure that if it is noise then each time you take 10 photos of mine in this pose and each one if you are measuring the number of pixels that are there using some thresholding algorithm then each time you may may or may not get the same value there will be one pixel offset here and there are two pixel offsets every time that you make that is noise but artifact if i have it here and you are going to measure it based on the image that you see of this can you think of scenarios that you when if you make a measurement based on the photo that you know is probably not the uh, actual measurement that at least from your experience you can tell oh this is this happened and therefore this is an artifact so i won't trust the measurement right easiest thing is oh when you are trying to take a photo i slightly move right motion if i do motion what will happen blurring that means instead of the, this size while taking the photo if i move then it will be blurred and therefore the width will become larger so you you can tell from the image the sharpness went down and probably you moved so you have all this auto correct right motion de blurring algorithms in your camera but that is an artifact so each time i can tell okay if you are going to move at certain velocity i can actually create the same image again and again right so that is your motion artifact is something that you are very familiar with or you would have encountered so blurring or streaks due to patient motion another common one that we encounter especially uh, uh, most of you would not have experienced it uh, some may if you have fractured a bone for example or you have some metallic objects went in they did ct uh, or if you have seen some uh, you know movies where the uh, a bullet is fired and the patient is taken to the um, you no know, room to take a x ray right or ct or somebody swallows you see that this is a foreign object metal right not your soft tissue so something when you when you take that you will end up noticing because of the huge difference in the material property you will get what is called as star artifact especially in ct this is very common because you are doing reconstruction so we'll we'll talk about that and that is because of presence of metallic material in patients okay so in some sense you you, you artifacts most of it if you encounter if you can characterize that if you understand that you can try to minimize it you can reproduce it therefore right and then something like beam hardening so this is little non intuitive right now we will talk about this when we get to the physics but essentially this happens because you see a sudden uh, you know uh, in the anatomy you, you, you know the anatomy right the doctor knows the anatomy suddenly he feels that there is a broad dark bands or streaks that are not really supposed to be there for that anatomy he has seen it day in and day out for normal patients that should not be a range of values that he sees there but sometimes what happens is due to this beam hardening artifact you start to see that and that is caused by sudden attenuation by certain materials right so we'll we'll talk about that when we when we get in details about the physics of interaction of x rays with material ring artifact oh this is another nice one that is spotted out ring artifact is when a detector is out of calibration so you have a detector array for example and one of them goes bad and then you see a characteristic uh, pattern in the image which will be of the, which will be resembling a ring so this is a common artifact that can that is fairly uh, recognizable 
so let's if you think okay i think i follow all of this then let's take a quiz right so how does it look so let's get the easy ones out a easy one would be oh there is a ring here i see something right looks like a ring so it is a ring artifact which is due to detector miscalibration or uh, element in the detector that's gone whatever and when you stand back and look at this you see like a star right <laughs> not really the star that you do but you really look at the streaks here it's like glow you know, twinkling star so you you see this is what they mean by star pattern we can actually make a very nice star that you think about right when you when you draw that we can do in your uh, in fact you can do yourself when we do reconstruction we can see where it comes from so this is star artifact okay so if there is a strong object and you if that is the case then there streaks because of the sudden change in the property now these two are little in fact this is the most difficult one this if you knew the anatomy right then you will you can guess oh okay you see some streams right it is so this is because of motion it is moving so motion artifact okay this is what is the beam hardening this is a little uh, difficult one or non intuitive at this point of time this is very subtle uh, subtle to us but for somebody who has been trained to look at these images day in and day out they will tell oh this i suspect from my experience i know this is not uh, really the material property there it is a artifact due to beam hardening okay so this we will pay little more attention when we get to the uh, portion of uh, beam interaction with uh, material okay good so that is for artifact examples let's move on to the uh, two other important ones is geometric distortion so geometric distortion means just recall is very pertinent just to give you a intuition before i i spoil so uh, let's use this camera system to our advantage okay it is just to give you the big picture idea so the objective is you need to measure the length of my fingers or width of my palm right or width of my forearm that is the objective so you are taking this medical image right you are going to do that so if i take the image now and give you so i'll give you only the image of the hand right you crop me out you are taking the image of my hand and you want measurement of my width of my fingers or width of my palm right i give you this image i give you this image i give you this image what will be the measurement of my hand wow depending on where my hand is how much distance my hand is from the camera right unless i have a correction factor calibration unless i have that the number of pixels that my hand will occupy my palm will occupy my fingers will occupy will be different when i close to the camera or far away from the camera so if you are going to measure and say so many pixels correspond to uh, this many millimeters or this many uh, centimeters so my hand is my finger is 5 centimeters if you say the width is 5 centimeters because i am close to the camera then you will say oh his hand is now 2 and 1/2 cm but my hand is not changing right it's only the position that is changing this is very vivid i mean you might look at this and say look oh this is not that uh, of a problem the problem is this is outside that you are doing what we want to use the medical imaging system is to see inside the body actually i don't know where the right i don't know if my lung nodule is in the front front of the chest or back of the chest i just go for a chest x ray 
the chest x ray is going to put everything on the plane of paper it is not going to tell me whether it is in the front of my chest or back of my chest so right there is a distance so uh, you cannot calibrate i mean so it's not that straightforward i can calibrate for the outside but what about inside i actually do not know how much they are separated if i know i can compensate the whole idea is i don't know that's why i'm going for a medical imaging to non invasively see what is there inside so it is a very tricky business sir. so you could have very complicated scenarios which are very significant which affect the outcomes in a significant way so for example here are the two scenarios very simplified scenario so say this is the object and you are going for a x ray imaging right x ray projection so if you have this you look at this the size of the object is different luckily here the shape were taken to be same we can complicate that also in reality you know you, you cannot force any shape right so this is different size and located at different depths in the body but if i take a image of this as a projection i will get the same shape and same size clearly this is not correct right my my actual object is only small here now that's appeared to be big here and these two were different are different but my image of them the projected image of them appears same okay so you can make your best efforts to make sure the the, the object is kept from certain distance and your detector is kept at a certain distance all that you can manipulate but uh, whether this uh, say for example if this is a tumor inside the body whether the tumor is here or tumor is there that you don't have control i mean that is unknown that's why you want to image and see if there is something so if you are going to just have everything else and then make a measurement and give a protocol uh, give a thing, oh this is greater than 2 cm so you need to go for surgery tomorrow it will become a tricky business so it's a challenging aspect so this is one way the other is you look at this they are supposed to be of the same size and shape slightly offset but then they are projected differently so one becomes circular the other becomes elongated ellipse both the scenarios are troublesome so what do we do oh this we can do the best we can calibrate it right understand where our equations are coming can we compensate for for that how do we uh, do the instrumentation how all what are the protocols that we can take right to minimize uh, this error this distortion is all something that we should pay attention to however it also has to do with the experience of the person who is doing it okay so here we had two different scenarios these are very in fact just for demonstration purpose these are actually simplified case life is more complicated you can have different shapes nothing is i mean if it's perfectly spherical no issues whichever angle you are going to see it's going to be appearing same right if, if for example if you are doing the the chest x ray if i have a sphere whichever direction where you are doing you know front or back you are going to get only a circular cross section if it's a sphere but reality you may have weird shape right so for example like here how do i know if if the hand i'm showing but for example if i cover the hand right i cover the hand right difficulty of optical imaging you cannot see inside the black everything is getting out from there so the idea is who says my hand is like this if it is like this it will give a different width if it is like this it will give a different width if i have this in front right so i don't know which direction it is right that is a problem it is inside so which projection i will see i don't know so that is a challenge so i can distract do the correction for everything else but still that uh, you know the distortion is going to be a challenge okay so last but not least in fact the most important one is accuracy in fact in accuracy like i said 
conformity to truth is one aspect the other is clinical utility what do we mean by uh, conformity to truth it is what we have this quantitative accuracy recall your uh, say for example measurements and error if you had a course in um, measurements right or even uh, stochastics uh, we cover that so essentially you would have heard about this right so you have your uh quantitative accuracy is based on measurements right the bias precision all that you you would have heard clinical utility means diagnostic accuracy when you go for a diagnosis right you do some measurements of some parameters clinical parameters and based on that parameter you say whether this is normal abnormal and so on and so forth so that is your diagnostic accuracy so conformity to truth or quantitative accuracy you, you you know it has to do with the measurement side of it so it's a numerical accuracy in terms of signal bias okay so you could have systemic so if there is a miscalibration whatever is supposed to be 2 mm i'm just saying some number 2 units is a millimeter so i'm measuring a, a tumor size of a tumor in an image and it turns out the actual ground truth is 5 mm tumor but because of miscalibration when you take the image and you measure it it comes out to be 1 cm right so then that means uh, it is miscalibrated that is a systemic bias so if i know that then i can immediately correct for it and say oh if it is 1 cm that means i have to subtract half a cm because there is a bias systemic bias so the actual size is only so that is not a problem okay that is your systemic bias but then the problem is noise imp it is not precise okay so that is your random part of it so that is your quantitative accuracy likewise your geometric accuracy right now we saw right distortions so geometric accuracy is accuracy in terms of so i have uh, a tumor i want to measure the size how accurate am i i i, I think it is a spherical shape or is it elliptical or is it something in between do i make correct am i accurate in saying that it is a circular one or a elliptical with uh, some b by a i am measuring it so how accurately am i capturing the geometry so this is all based on the measurements okay uh, so that is something that you will be involved because as a systems engineer you will do that but these are okay because this will be you you have control over everything you can have a calibrated phantom remember we talked about this uh, resolution bar phantom like you can have a a calibrated phantom every dimensions is known right and then you use the system and you characterize it so you can report all this quantitative accuracy geometry all this you can correct for and uh, do it the challenge is when you put it to a patient each patient is different in fact each patient is different the same patient is changing with the time right so to that extent that is also different so the challenges happen in clinical utility okay so this is fine quantitative accuracy is more from a engineering perspective that you you can handle this the more significant one is your diagnostics diagnostic accuracy why because uh, that is uh, having a lot of impact so i make some measurements from the image for example and i say oh the size of your um, say kidney right or size of your liver is supposed to be so many uh, or volume of your liver is supposed to be so much but now i a patient comes and you do the measurement you do the image and from the image you are measuring it and you get some x value right so normal value is some n cc you measure it and you get x cc so now you have to make oh is this x normal are you normal do you have a normal liver size or it is bloated or it is shrunk you have to make that call so you measure this parameter right you measure the size for example here and you have to make a diagnostic call so if you say you have a problem uh, you know the size is larger than the normal 
and if you are able to get the ground truth value then you know whether the diagnostics is good or bad right diagnostic how accurate is it to the ground truth so you do this uh, parameter measurements from the image so which we call as test result and you have to make a decision so how based on that if you are making a decision how good is that decision that is usually used right the terms like sensitivity specificity will be used to capture that okay so example here for a particular test result is here it is always a probability only ideally you want to be 100% certain okay so ideally you want to be normal this is a distribution of that parameter whatever so i said the example is uh, say size of the liver right liver value so for normal this is how the distribution is but when there is a disease then you have a different distribution distribution is same but then it is offset so that means in this case if this is a size then size is increased size but then the challenge always is there are going to be people who are otherwise normal who could still have a small percentage of them could still have a larger size and there could be some people who are deceased right who will, who may still have smaller size so you are going to this is always a probability so you do this measurement based on the measurement you have to say whether the person is normal or deceased so you have this distribution you make a call if it is above a threshold you say it is deceased below a threshold you say it is normal but then by doing that what you realize is there are going to be some people who are deceased who you will send home saying that you are normal and there are going to be some people who are normal who you will send for further follow up because your threshold it is greater than your threshold so you are going to diagnose them as having likely would of disease right so you can look at the so then there is one population where they are actually normal and you have asked them to go home normal and there are people who are deceased who have asked correctly to follow up so you have four instances right you have four instances so you have disease is positive your test is also positive your disease is negative there is no disease your test is also saying there is no disease but the troublesome is there is disease and your test says there is no disease or there is no disease and your test says you have disease right in 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 other courses when you have done this you would have heard people you know the confusion matrix okay so this is so that means from here you can get different uh, values one specifying right a b c d are the values here so you can have all the different cases with the disease test what so different combinations four different combinations so typically you are interested in sensitivity which is a fraction of right a what is a disease is there and the test is also catching it and a plus c is the total number of people who have disease right so your sensitivity is how many times the test catches the disease amongst the total number of disease population right that is sensitivity if it is 100% sensitive means all a plus c right 100% sensitive means i won't have anybody so i will have one so all people who are having disease are captured specificity has to do with how specific your d is what disease is not there and your test is also saying it is not there so how specific if you say you don't have a disease and you ask them to go home how specific is it right so d by b plus d so b plus d tells about the population that are not having disease right amongst the population that are not having disease how many are you sending home based on the test also saying there is no disease right 
ideally what is the case oh you want to be 100 percent specific meaning everybody who doesn't have a disease i want them to go home that means i will have d divided i won't i shouldn't have any b b is there is no disease but my test says you have disease so i should not have any b so it will be d by d will be one right so in reality obviously your sensitivity and specificity are going to be less than one so instead of doing it like that one uh, metric that combines both is your diagnostic accuracy diagnostic accuracy is essentially saying it is a uh, sum total right how many times i correctly pick people with uh, disease as disease and how many times when i say they don't have disease they don't have disease both sensitivity and specificity combined together both are decisions when i say there is a disease that is a decision when i say there is no disease that is also a decision both are correct decisions so number of times how accurate am i in making the decision that is captured in diagnostic accuracy right so it is a plus d a plus d both positive positive negative negative so i do the correct diagnosis a plus d is my correct diagnosis correct diagnosis out of the total decisions total number that captures your accuracy so i think this is a good time to stop what we will do going forward is start with the first modality of x-ray based projection radiography. Thank you.